to be a white man. I come and I go, and that's my business. The white folks are on his own horses. Now you go back and tell your boss that I control the numbers in Harlem, and that's the way it stays. I'll drill the skill of the masters into you and drive out the spirit of jazz. I have to make you play 20 hours straight. Got my girl, and the name is Nettie. cities at the turn of the century. Movies were misunderstood. Blacks were unwelcome. Movies at first were no more than topical little chases for vaudeville shows. The standard white reaction to the thousands of blacks who had moved to northern cities was to blame them for their own poverty and ignorance and to pigeonhole them into ghettos in the city and into those ghettos of the mind racial stereotypes. For migrants from the South, there were complications and ironies. Whites saw them only in the few narrow alleys of behavior that had been shaped many years before as an excuse for slavery and the repressions after the Civil War. Even the movies of those days showed blacks in terms of cliches. They liked watermelons. They suffered when their masters suffered. And they never got mad at anyone. Uh, well, hardly ever. These were the old-fashioned leftovers from Southern law, the clay from which movie makers expected to make black images. Real life was different, more urban, more varied. Black men could fight in the nation's wars, as they did in the Spanish-American War. They could root for the black boxing champion, Jack Johnson, as he pummeled a parade of great white hopes. And they could even lead the annual parade on the boardwalk at Atlantic City. Blacks had moved from the South to cold northern cities, where in the years between 1900 and 1925, they struggled to become a new people. Looking cityward for survival and salvation from lynching and rural poverty, they often found squalor instead of salvation. By the teens of this century, old black stereotypes clearly had no place in America. Who was to define the new Negro, both to himself and to the white world? First on the scene were old rivals in a contest for nationwide black leadership. Booker T. Washington and his secretary, Emmett J. Scott, on one hand, and Debbie E.B. Du Bois of a new organization, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, on the other. What aroused their anger that summer of 1915 was national reaction to D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, the first real screen epic. It had spectacle, stars, glamour, thrilling drama. More than that, it expressed the most racist Southern attitudes and images. The picture promptly blamed the abolitionists for the Civil War, proclaiming that slavery was less an evil than the underpinning of a traditional Southern way of life. Said Thomas Dixon, the author of the novel from which the movie was made. The object is to teach the North what is never known, the awful suffering of the white man during the dreadful Reconstruction period. I believe that Almighty God anointed the white men of the South by their suffering to demonstrate to the world that the white man must and shall be supreme. It wasn't only the racial assault of the birth of a nation that enraged blacks. Publicity press releases and posters, clanging bands and marches, and press agent gimmickry ballooned the picture into a monstrous celebration 
of the old-fashioned southern version of the nightmare of Reconstruction. Dixon even wangled an endorsement from an old schoolmate, the President of the United States. It is like writing history with lightning, and it is all so terribly true. Griffith would spend the rest of his life uncomprehending, making excuses, and counterattacking his critics. In the first flush of anger, black leaders called for censorship. Despite well-publicized legal battles of the NAACP, the birth of a nation was shown pretty much at will, sparking racial hatred by showing ambitious mulattoes lusting after white women. In spite of the clatter over the birth of a nation, one man almost saved the day. ended by making a comment on black institutions and white control. Bert Williams was not universally admired by blacks. He seemed to get along too well with whites, and to laugh off too many hurts, and to make it in white institutions like the Ziegfeld Follies. There's no disgrace being a Negro, goes his strongest line on racism, but it is sometimes inconvenient. Blacks were at a loss. Protest over continued showings of birth of a nation came to nothing. Their only hope was to pull together in common cause and make movies of their own, movies known as race movies. Emmett J. Scott went to work on a film. Shooting started in Tampa, Florida. The birth of a race was not a critical success. Few people saw it after a splashy opening at Chicago's Blackstone Theater. It was the first black attempt to reach a nationwide audience with a major motion picture. It failed, but it also inspired a young black male man in Omaha. George Johnson and his brother Noble, an actor at Universal Studios, formed the Lincoln Motion Picture Company to make good movies for black audiences. The men of Lincoln came from a cohesive black middle class in Los Angeles, men on the make and keenly race conscious. The Lincoln movies, with their black versions of the American success myth, aim straight at the heart of this urban black bourgeoisie. These fragments of a seven-reel film called By Right of Birth are the only pieces of a Lincoln Motion Picture Company film known to survive today. The star of By Right of Birth, Clarence Brooks, played the part of a black Horatio Alger. lawyers, smooth, trim women, and for laughs, even a comic chauffeur. Another of their efforts was called The Realization of a Negro's Ambition, the story of a young man who, despite initial setbacks, wins the money and the girl. The Johnsons also made a timeless story based on the true adventures of a black soldier in the border wars against Mexican revolutionaries, the trooper of Troop K. George Johnson recently described the making of the film. They started to work by uh, going down to the costume supply company and rented uniforms for soldiers, Mexican sombreros, the 
went down on Central Avenue and rounded up 25 or 30 ex-Negro cowboys, And they rounded up 40 or 50 Mexicans down in Mexico town. So they went out there and uh, Sam Gable Walsh had a sham battle between the colored troopers, them and the Mexicans. Lincoln did not even survive the early 20s. Their failure revealed every sad fact of life the black companies were forced to live with. Scant capital, few bookings, moonlighting technicians, and their best stars, like Brooks, could take the streetcar to Hollywood and get an occasional part in a real Hollywood movie. Worst of all, the Johnsons could not fight the dozens of fly-by-night hustlers who crept into the fringes of the business with glossy promises that ate up capital and produced no movies. Or like the Ebony Company with its big Chicago studio, white money, black frontmen who retail the old stereotypes and modern form, such as spying the spy. secret history until now of George and Noble Johnson and their Lincoln Company and Emmett J. Scott and his grand first stride toward a black cinema. They failed to reach millions of moviegoers, but they opened a trail for black filmmakers to follow. A trail of positive roles, enterprise, and decent black images. If the teens belong to these pioneers, then the years of boom and bust of the 20s belonged to a young black man from the Dakota Prairie, Oscar Michaud. Oscar Michaud's first movie, The Homesteader, opened in 1919 at the beginning of a bright, optimistic period. For the first time since Reconstruction, it seemed that black folks might share in the promise of American life. If its surface brightness covered the poverty underneath, who was there to protest? The World War had ended. Times were good. Harlem was in the midst of an artistic, social, and economic renaissance. There seemed to be a little more money. Black pride rivaled old negative feelings. Black protesters shared the streets with the Ku Klux Klan for the first time. Marcus Garvey's strongly nationalist Universal Negro Improvement Association advocated separatism and to return to Mother Africa and signal the arrival of new times. Dunbar, Rio, Rosebud, Gate City, Norman, black studios grew with the times. Of them all, Oscar Michaud most answered the needs of the new Negro. This rare tinted print of body and soul is all that remains of his silent work. It was a different look at those rock-ribbed stalwarts of the black community the church and the preacher. Bot and Soul was released in several different versions, changing Paul from a crook to a crime-fighting preacher who rids the town of bootleggers. In this version, the wicked preacher has a twin brother, also played by Robeson. The preacher drinks hard liquor, is a friend of gamblers and mobsters, assaults a girl, the daughter of one of his trusting parishioners, steal the mother's life savings, and brutally attacks the girl's brother who is trying to bring him to justice. Body and soul is startling in the power of Robeson's performance. All his promise as an actor and as a personality is apparent in scene after scene. Lorenzo Tucker, one of the stars who worked for Michaud, recalls... Uh, he would uh, uh, get uh, crunched over in the chair and behind the camera. He would go through all the motions. Uh, he would twist his mouth. And if you looked at him, it was almost like watching uh, a musical conductor with a bad time.
death of the girl and the rest of the lurid melodramatic plot turns out to be a nightmare. The mother awakes and all ends happily. The good brother gets the girl. With no distribution organization, Oscar Michaud had to sell his own films door to door. When he took a movie on the road, it was always under his personal direction, slogging the countryside with the film cans under his arm. In one summer, he had Chattanooga, Birmingham, Bessemer, Shreveport, Spartanburg, Greenville, Durham, Mobile, and 15 other southern towns, selling his films to theaters who showed mostly split weeks and one-nighters. In Philadelphia, he once took in $3,000 for a single run. He took white money only when he had to. But Michaud brought more to movies than his black rivals. His movies exploited the sensibilities of the new black life. Michaud's only rival was the Colored Players Company of Philadelphia, whose social drama, Scar of Shame, topped off the 20s. A black vaudevillian, Sherman Dudley, fronted for two white journeyman producers. Together they made films with Charles Gilpin and other black stage actors of the day. Lucia Lynn Moses, one of the stars, remembers the making of the film. I was picked from a course line, and before I knew it, they had talked me into making this picture in Philadelphia. I was never an actress, and they just told me, walk over here, or walk over there, or do this, or do the other, and I did exactly as they said. Every time I do something, they said it was great. within black circles, less pronounced than white man's segregation, but another burden for blacks to bear. This picture was made when black wasn't beautiful. But I remember colored people segregated each other. I wish the picture almost tells you that. If you were more educated, if one Negro was uh, better educated than they felt a little above the other one. into leaving her husband by a conniving nightclub owner and to commit suicide once she learns that her husband will marry a girl of his own set. But my baby sister had a beautiful dress and I said, look, Julie, can I borrow your dress for the movie I'm making over there? And she said, well, okay, but take care of it. And that's the dress you see in the last part of the picture. Everybody asked us, Julie, did you see Lucia's picture? She said, I didn't go to see Lucia, I went to see my dress. silent era came to an end. Misha had changed and refocused the image of the black man. But of the black man. But more important, their movies reached out to black audiences with inspirational messages, movie versions of black novels, and just good crackling melodramas. Something of the complexities of black life had finally been transposed to film. Great crash of 1929. Race movies would never be the same. 